Hi, my name's Michelle Gellis. I am an acupuncture physician and I teach facial and cosmetic acupuncture classes internationally. And I am going to talk to you today about facial fascia and um, what it is and how it can affect uh, your facial acupuncture treatments and how it can affect your um, patient's appearance. So I want to thank the American Acupuncture Council for this opportunity. And I need to see the first slide. So what is facial fascia? That is going to be the first thing we talk about today. And after that, we will discuss how it affects your facial appearance and the movement of your face. So it's not just about cosmetic, but also how your face functions. And then some treatment modalities, things we can do in order to affect the um, function of the face by treating the fascia layer. So facial fascia is composed of two layers. And the first is the superficial facial fascia. And that is uh, on the uh, outer layer. And that is, it's right underneath your skin. And it helps to support your face and hold everything up and it's responsible for giving you a youthful appearance. And it also can carry a lot of tension in it and restrict circulation to the face. So things can get trapped, whether um, it's lymphatic fluid or blood, um, and even some of the superficial nerves. Then we have the deep fascia layer, and that kind of forms a girdle, and it is called the SMAS layer, the superficial muscular aponeurotic system. So the um, superficial layer itself has well the superficial fascia itself has two layers it has the outer layer which is this kind of fatty layer and then we have the smas layer which is right here and that is what allows us to make facial expressions it takes the nerve impulses from deep and sends them out to the muscle, which then uh, translates out to our skin. So the superficial uh, fascia layer is what is responsible for our facial expressions. And the deep fascia layer, which includes the uh, fascia of the temporalis, because the temporalis is connected to the face, uh, the parotid fascia, which goes down into the neck, the periosteum, which works around the part of the skull that connects to the face, and the septum, the area around the orbit or the eye area. And this is where the deep fascia uh, exists on the face. So here's a, a pictorial representation of a piece of bone and a muscle and the skin. And the reason why this is important is because our face is the only part of our body where the skin is connected to the, the skin layer is connected to the bone. 
through muscle, which is why you can move the skin on your face without having to move any part of your face. So you don't have to move a joint um, in order to move the skin on your face everywhere else on your body. If you want to move the skin, one of your body parts has to move. The skin can't move separate from the, uh, the body part. So one of the things that can happen is, so here's the bone and here's the fat and the muscle and the skin. And what can happen is, so as, as the muscle contracts, the skin gets pulled towards the bone and we can get this kind of wrinkling of the skin, right? Like if you smile, if you raise your eyebrows, if you pull your eyebrows together, if you purse your lips, right? You can purse your lips without having to move any bone at all, just by moving the muscle, the orbicularis oris. And what can happen is we can get these fascial adhesions, which are like scar tissue. Um, they can happen as we age, they can happen through injury, they can happen through overuse or underuse. And it's this very fibrous collagen fibers. Um, it's, it's like if you think about if you have uh, like a chicken and uh, you kind of pull the chicken away from the bone, there's that layer. It uh, almost looks like really um, strong cobwebs. And those fibers can trap nerves and blood and other things. And they can cause these adhesions where it can prevent the full expression on our face of uh, different facial expressions, the full movement. And um, like if an individual perhaps had a stroke and things or Bell's palsy and things don't move for a long time, then you have to physically get this area moving because of these fascial adhesions that can form. So here's the um, bone, here's a piece of bone and uh, here's the fascia and here is a nerve which as you could see could get trapped in the fascia and it could prevent the signaling. So the muscle won't even get the signal that it needs to move because the nerve is trapped or it can reduce the ability of the muscle to move well. And it can also restrict blood flow, you can see there's veins that could also get trapped. So here's a picture of someone with Bell's palsy. They're making a facial expression with the right side of their face, but the left side of their face isn't moving at all. And part of this is due to uh, nerve damage, but it can also be from entrapment. And wrinkles, when we think of wrinkles, we think of something that happens as we age. And in many cases, it can be from sun damage, it can be from um, just the skin getting older, but also, if you habitually make an expression and the skin is attached to the fascia, if that fascia is restricted at all, then you can end up with these deep wrinkles. We see it a lot in people's foreheads and um, even sometimes around the eyes with crow's feet or 
the lips and uh, also with jowling. And I'm going to talk about a couple of ways that we can help with this, but sometimes wrinkles and sagging are reversible just by uh, doing things to the fascia layer. So here we have an example of forehead wrinkles. Perhaps this person made the expression where they raised their eyebrows a lot. Also, this is when I said jowling, this is um, what is referred to as a jowl. And it can happen through the aging process. Things loosen and they become kind of affixed into a new position. Sometimes it's from excess weight on the face. Sometimes it's from habitually uh, frowning. And uh, when, when I was young, my mother used to say to me, don't make that face, it's going to stay that way. And uh, there was actually a lot of truth to that. So uh, a lot of our facial expressions get etched on our face over time. So what are some of the treatment modalities that we can use in order to affect this fascia on the face? Well, one very effective treatment is facial cupping. Now, facial cupping is um, something, it's, it's a skill that you uh, would need to learn. Uh, it's not like cupping on the back. You don't want to try to use your glass cups and uh, cup the face the way you would a back or a neck or a shoulder or a hip. Uh, facial cupping uses small cups and um, they look like this. And you would use these small cups and oil and you would glide these cups across the skin you don't park the cups and you do it in such a way that encourages lymphatic drainage and works with the anatomy of the face and uh, this is a cupping set that uh, is made by Aculift skincare and so there's a slightly larger cup and a smaller cup for different types of wrinkles and the rubber part is very easy to squeeze so you can squeeze and move and release and squeeze and move and release and really kind of keep that chi and energy going facial gua sha is also another technique that we can use um, and here are some facial gua sha tools. You can see that they are, uh, these are made out of jade and they're specially shaped to work around the jowls, the cheeks, to work along the temporalis and underneath the chin, across the clavicle, lots of places where we can get these adhesions and by uh, this kind of physical movement of doing the cupping and then the gua sha afterwards, you help to keep the lymphatic system of the face moving, the blood and the chi moving, and also to really get in there and break up those fascial adhesions, especially with the gua sha tool on the forehead, you can spread the wrinkles and you can really get in there and break up a lot of that tension and that tight fascia. So this is a picture of me just doing some gua sha along the jaw jawline, kind of sculpting the face, helping to lift everything up. And the next technique that we can use, which is very beneficial 
for submuscular needle, I mean, for uh, treating facial fascia is submuscular needling. And this is a technique where you would um, work on different areas of the face. And um, I teach a whole class just on uh, submuscular needling and it involves taking your needles and getting um, underneath the muscle. So you're really getting underneath these mimetic muscles. I've lost my mouse, where'd it go? Uh, you get underneath the mimetic muscles and you're going to needle right through and down. And this can help get into the superficial fascia and then into some of the deeper fascia, depending on which part of the face you're working on. And you would insert a few needles underneath the muscle, depending on what part of the face you're working on. So I have a quick video that I'll um, show in a moment, but you can use this to work underneath the masseter. You can use this to work along the attachment points for the platysma. You can work into and underneath the anterior digastric. You can work underneath the corrugator muscles. You can work underneath the uh, frontalis muscle, um, pretty much any muscle where on the face where you have access to uh, the margins of the muscle, you can get underneath there. And this can really effectively break up some of those fascial adhesions, which is uh, really quite wonderful. And um, let's see. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, but you can see it and I can, I can talk through it. So when needling the frontalis muscle, the way that you isolate the muscle is you ask your patient to raise their eyebrows. Go ahead and raise your eyebrows. Okay. And then, so this is uh, the relax. frontalis muscle. And you can find the border of the frontalis muscle and the way that you needle is you're going to go uh, from the origin to the insertion so, so you the find the borders up here and the insertion is here <clears throat> and typically what i do is i will put in usually three needles and then you get right on underneath the, the muscle lateral on either edge. side. And I will put in two needles on the medial side. And when you're needling, what's important is that the angle of the tube is the angle that the needle is going to go in. So if you go like this, it's going to go too deep. If you go like this, it's going to be too shallow. I use my thumb or a finger to help to guide the needle. So you want to keep your fingers out of the way when you're actually inserting. That way you can get to the correct depth right underneath the muscle. That's the lateral side. Then you're going to do the medial side and usually two needles will suffice and um, I do the one side and then I do the other side and I'm using half inch needles you can use one inch needles depending on how um, big your patient's forehead is so you just get all the way down underneath the muscle and isolate the muscle and needle right underneath it. And this, you would just leave the needles in for 
anywhere from 15 minutes to a half an hour. And uh, this is especially helpful, let's say your patient has Bell's palsy or uh, some sort of facial paralysis. You can do it on both sides, you can do it on one side, wherever the muscles are affected. This is just a list of some of the classes that I teach, uh, facial and cosmetic acupuncture, facial cupping. Um, a lot of what we talked about today is from my treating neuromuscular facial, uh, neuromuscular facial conditions class. I do some self-care for acupuncturists, safety, ethics, microneedling, and um, a lot of the techniques that we use for cosmetic acupuncture can also be beneficial for treating neuromuscular facial conditions like ptosis or um, if someone's had a stroke, TMJ, and vice versa. A lot of times when you're working with a neuromuscular facial condition that your patient might have, it also helps to benefit the uh, movement of their face and therefore their skin will look healthier and uh, more vibrant.